Good morning, everybody. First, I want to take a little second. I've been thinking this for some time. I will tell anyone who will listen that I think we have one of the best worship bands around. <laughs> yeah, amen. Guys, um, <laughs> I would say that they are probably the best that I have ever had a chance to work with, and I've worked with a lot. I've had a lot of good and competent musicians uh, on the church staff that I've worked with over the years, and I know that they don't do it for our praise. Right? They do it for the glory of our, our King and Savior. But at the same time, I think there ought to be some times when we just uh, say how we appreciate their ability to bring us into an atmosphere of worship. Amen? Amen? So let me say thank you, guys. Wow, this was a crazy week, wasn't it, this past week? You know, whether your candidate won or didn't win, we can all be thankful of one thing. We don't have to put up with any more political ads for a while. <laughs> Amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I even got political ads this, uh, this season on my phone. Did any of you get on your phone? Somebody asked them for five, ten bucks to support their candidate. And I was reading an a, um, article this past week. It was probably about like Friday. It was after the election. That said that over $30 billion, not million, billion dollars had been spent on political ads this season. Think about that. And then I had also read the same day an article that stated that all of those ads had little to no effect on the voting population because the vast majority of people had already made up their mind on who they wanted to vote for. So you think about that. What could we have done with $30 billion? You know what I mean? We could have just taken a little drop of that and built our new building, huh? <laughs> but at any rate. But I did hear some good um, political jokes, and my brother... He has a warped sense of humor. He really does. But I love him anyways. And he sent me this, um, this video of Ronald Reagan telling a joke that he used to love to tell. And I'm going to try to tell it to you if I can remember it real good. But there was a, a horrible theology. I'll say that up front, but it's a good joke. But at any rate, there was an evangelical pastor and a very famous politician who happened to die on the same day. And they, at the same time, appeared before St. Peter at the pearly gates of heaven. And St. Peter welcomed them and went through all of the necessary formalities and said, well, let me show you to your living quarters where you're going to be staying up here in heaven. And so they started walking down the golden streets of heaven, and they came to this really modest-looking building, and they went inside, and they came to this, uh, it was rather stark, Spartan room, where it only had like a twin bed, a chair, a table, and a lamp on it, right? And he turned to the uh, evangelical pastor and said, well, this is where you're going to be staying, all right? Well, the politician started getting worried. He said, well, if this is what this good and holy man is going to get, what am I going to get? You know what I mean? And they went back out, and they're walking down the street, and they came to this gigantic mansion with tons of room, uh, rooms in it and a huge property, and they even had servants who were working on it to keep it up. To, and he turned to the politician, and he said, this is going to be where you live, right? And the politician thought, you know, something must be wrong. You know, I'm confused, right? How did that good and holy man get that little tiny room, and I get this gigantic mansion? And St. Peter said, well, you have to understand how things work up here, right? You see, we have thousands upon thousands of pastors and priests that we have to find accommodations for. But you're the first politician that's ever made it. <laughs> I like that. But it got me thinking about how when I was young, the head of the Republican Party was President Reagan, who was president, and that because of that, he was the highest ranking Republican in the land. And then there was a man named Tip O'Neill. Anybody remember Tip O'Neill, who was the head of the uh, Democratic Party, had the highest ranking Democrat position as Speaker of the House, right? And they could not have been further apart. I mean, they were polar opposites on their, on their views and stuff. But what I always found fascinating was is that in their personal life, they were best of friends. Right? In fact, over the years, many books and articles have been written about their, their friendship. Right? And it was a known fact that many times people would see them at different restaurants and different places um, eating and drinking together. And they truly had. I remember watching this one video, too, this, after I read about that. I watched this one little video, and it was, um, it was at Tip O'Neill's retirement party. And you couldn't help but cry because Ronald Reagan got up there and he started saying some, you know, telling his jokes like he always did. But at the very end, he just got real quiet and he said, you know, I will probably never have such a good friend as Tip O'Neill, right? And it was just this beautiful moment and you thought, why doesn't that happen today? You know what I mean? And they were talking about, he was talking about how they used to go fishing together. And I started thinking, can you imagine if Kamala and Trump got in a little boat and went out fishing <laughs> together, right? I mean... You and I both know that probably somebody's not coming back alive from that, right? 
<laughs> and, but you know, back then, it wasn't uncommon for people to be great friends who had different beliefs, right? My best friend that I grew up with, who was the best man at my wedding, we could not have been more polar opposite. And we had some, <laughs> some rather nasty debates from time to time, but they were just that. They were debates. And we came back to the things that we had in common. He loved his Lord and Savior. I love my Lord and Savior, right? He's now a minister down in Tennessee. I'm out here. He thinks I've fallen off the edge of the world. But the point is, is that when we were growing up, you know, we had these different beliefs, but we still could be best friends, right? And, you know, I tell everybody, you know, when I was growing up, you know, we all talk about the good old days. (laughs) They weren't all good, my friends, okay? (laughs) I was thinking back this past week about how uh, there was in the late 70s and 80s this this literal wasteland of fashion and design, right? I mean, (laughs) how many of you remember these colors and schemes, okay? Anybody remember shag carpet? I mean, that was of the devil, but... um, But I remember my uh, my um, oldest brother and sister. They were twelve and thirteen years older than me, and um, <laughs> they were of the disco generation, right? And on there, yeah, somebody go, whoo, yeah, somebody remember that too. <laughs> Any rate, point is, is that uh, I remember when um, my brother, a couple of weeks before his wedding, right, him and his uh, fiance, my now my sister in law Becky, decided that they were going to both get afros for their wedding, right. <laughs> Now, does anybody, this is not my brother, a picture of my brother, but does anybody remember those tight <laughs> curls? You remember that? The, they, were, they both had blonde hair. They both, I mean, they looked like two blonde Q-tips. I mean, it was, it was awful when they were coming down there. And I'm just a little boy watching this play out. And then my mother, uh, she had, uh, I guess a lot of people her age, middle age, uh, that time period, they had the same kind of hairstyle. And I think it came from Dolly Parton, where they stacked the hair up on top. My mother's hair was stacked up so high at that wedding, it defied the laws of Newtonian physics and gravity. I mean, it was way up there. And, and then as they all went out, my mother followed them out, you know, to kiss them goodbye as they went on their honeymoon and stuff like that. And they got in uh, Becky's AMC Pacer. Does anybody remember this horrible engineering catastrophe, right? Literally from behind, it looked like a fishbowl on wheels, right? And I'm just a boy watching this whole thing play out, and I'm thinking... Thank you, Jesus, this went by the wayside, right? That we don't have to deal with those, those horrible uh, fashions anymore. But guys, I got to thinking that this past week. And my point in saying all that is, is that I've been in ministry a long time, right? I'm you know, old and crusty when it comes to uh, youth pastors. And over the time that I've been in ministry, I have seen great changes in our nation. And to be truthful with you, and to be honest with you, they're not all good, you know? I've seen so many changes over the years, and, and, I'm not, and the things that I'm worried about are not like, you know, fashion and style and cost of living and politics and all those kind of things. The things that worry me and trouble my heart are the changes I've seen in God's church over the years and also in the family dynamics of our nation because I deal with youth, and I have for 32 years. I have seen such changes, monumental changes in the family dynamics of our, our country, and I can't help but wonder if it's not because of the growing lack of Christ in our society, right? And as I sit back and I just survey my life, I see these changes. But at the same time, I am an optimist. I believe that our God has the power to do anything, anytime, any place. amen? And he has the ability to work through his people, right, to make change. And that's exactly a story that we're going to look at this morning, and that's what I want to talk with you about. But first, let's go to the Lord and ask him to bless our time. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I come before you this morning. Lord, you know that I am not a perfect person. I sin all the time, Lord, and I just want to make sure that there is nothing between you and me this morning so these good people can hear you, Lord. They do not need to hear me. Lord, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what I think. It only matters what you say and what you think, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that you remove me from the equation. I believe like, you know, Peter and the disciples in the marketplace, everybody will hear what they need to hear, Lord, because I believe that your spirit has the power to impact us, to move our lives and move in our heart, Lord. And so I pray that that happens today, Lord. Just kick me out of the way in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. This morning, I want us to look at one of the most important stories, what I believe is one of the most important stories in the Old Testament, one that I think is not told nearly enough, but I think it has massive implications and importance for our our nation in general. And before I get into that, i got to give you a little, well, unfortunately for you guys, (laughs) a lot of background, right? But hang with me on this one, okay? Now, 
If you guys know a little bit about your, your biblical history, the very first king of Israel was a man named Saul. Now, Saul was not who God had picked, right? But all of the Israelites, they wanted a king like all the nations around them. They wanted a big buff guy who was a warrior king, right? And so they picked Saul, and Saul was certainly that, right? And he was a great warrior. But he wasn't who God picked, right? And in time, you know, he did allow them to have King Saul. But in time, uh, time proved that he was definitely not the person that God wanted. And so God picked another man, and that man's name was David. It's a beautiful story we don't have time to get into today. But David was not a perfect man either, right? But David was a man, as the Bible says, after God's own heart. And I can't think of a greater compliment that is given in the entire Bible. Imagine if God came to you and said, you are a person after my own heart. You know what I mean? What more you want, right? But he wasn't perfect, but he tried his best to follow God's way. And then his son, Solomon, was born. And Solomon pleased God. The Bible says that God delighted in Solomon and loved him and blessed him. Um, And Solomon was the one who got to build the temple of God, right? But if you know the story, unfortunately, as he got older and he married wives that the Lord told him not to marry, right, that they began to pull his heart away from God. And and worse, they started teaching his sons to follow the gods that they believed in. In fact, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Think about that, 700 wives. I have trouble enough with one. But... (laughs) And I can say that because she's not here today. <laughs> oh, this is recorded, isn't it? Uh. <laughs> any rate, point being is this, guys, right? Over a course of time in his life, uh, his wives, right, the very people that God told him not to marry, began to pull his heart and his children's hearts away from him. And then, unfortunately, when he died, his two sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, split his kingdom in two, Right? And it's a really sad story, and it's another one that we don't have time to go into today. But when Rehoboam's, uh, Rehoboam's grandson, Asa, came to the throne of Judah, a period of about 220 years came about where, for the most part, they had some bad kings, but for the most part, the southern kingdom followed God's ways, right? So much so that the people who lived around Israel started to make fun of the people in Judah. And they called them, I love this name, whoop, I love this name. It's called Al Al Katab. They called them the people of the book, right? Because everything they did, everything they believed came from this one book that they believed was the actual words of God, right? We call it our Bible, right? The Old Testament. And they believed that everything they needed, whether it be their, from their, for their legal system, for how to live their life, all came from this book. And so the people around them used this term as to make fun of them, Right? But they took it as a compliment, and they uh, called themselves Am Hasafer, which means people of the book in Hebrew, right? And they were that for, like I said, for about 200 years. Well, at the end of King Hezekiah's reign, he was the last good king that they had for a while, came to the throne a very evil man, and his uh, name was Manasseh, right? And Manasseh was, um, this dude was as bad as it gets, Right? He had like an agenda to go after God's people, people who believed in God. Not only that, but he killed the prophets of God. In fact, Jewish tradition tells us that he is the one who had Isaiah killed, right? The great prophet Isaiah. I love the book of Isaiah, right? And he surrounded himself with astrologers and sorcerers. He's just as bad as you can get back then, right? And unfortunately, he reigned for 55 years. Think about that. You know, if we don't like a president, we can get rid of him in four years, right? And after eight, they can't run again, right? So imagine keeping one for 55 years, right? And then, unfortunately, his son, uh, Ammon, came to the throne after him, and he was worse. Fortunately, he only ruled for two years before he passed away, right? But then something interesting happened, and it's what I want us to concentrate on today. A young boy came to the throne named Josiah, right? Josiah, at, the eight years, uh, at eight years of age, came to the throne. Now, Josiah had been raised by his mother, who secretly worshipped our God, Jehovah, right? And taught him to do so against the wishes of her husband and the king of Israel, right? And so when Josiah was um, in his 18th year of his reign, right? When he was in his mid-20s by then, and he felt powerful enough in himself to start doing the things that he wanted to do. He started to tear down all of the... Um, the idols in the temple. One of the things that Manasseh did, I forgot to tell you was, is that he literally put an altar inside of God's temple to the false god Azareth, right? I mean, a 
total abomination, right? Well, one of the things that Josiah did when he was old enough and felt strong enough to do was to tear down all of that and to begin to remodel and to clean out the temple, right? Take all of that stuff from the other gods, get it out of there. And he also took uh, tax money from the people to literally refurbish the temple, right? And here's where it gets interesting, right? Well, one day the new high priest that... um, Josiah appointed a man named Hilkiah was literally cleaning out some back corner, like the resource room over here or something like that, right? At some back corner of the church. And in this dusty corner, he came across this large jar. And inside it was a scroll. And that scroll was the word of God, right? And he started reading it and he thought, oh my goodness, I've got to take this to Josiah. And so he went and he brought this scroll, right? Which we believe um, was the first five books of the Bible, the Mosaic Laws, right? And he brought it to, uh, to, to Josiah, and he began to read it. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, <clears throat> Ahiakim the son of Sapphim, Akbor, son of Micaiah, Sapphim the secretary, and Isaiah the king's attendant. Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judea about what is written in the book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because of those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. So you understand what's happening here, right? You have Josiah who's brought this book. He'd been worshiping God, but they didn't have the book. So I'm like, I guess they're going by like word of mouth, right? And so he's worshiping this God and then they bring him this book and he reads and he finds that even what he thought it meant to follow God was a lie. He falls down on the ground. He rips his clothes in anguish, realizing how far off base his country had gotten, right? And all the evil that they were doing in the eyes of the Lord, right? And I remember when I was uh, young and going through seminary, this story always bothered me, right? Because I couldn't understand how a people, right, who loved God, who were called God's people, that everything that they knew and did came from this one book, could become people who couldn't even find the book. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was in some dusty corner, right, rotting, and they couldn't find it. And I was just dumbfounded about it. How could people of the book become people who couldn't even find the book in a little over 50 years? Think about that, right? And as I was sitting there thinking about that this past week, I started worrying about our country, right? You know, our country, whether you like it or not, whether you believe in some different history, I started out, maybe you don't know this, I started out as a history teacher before I went into ministry, right? And what boggles my mind is how so many people don't realize that, yes, our country was founded on God's word. Our legal code was everything, right? And how we truly were proud of ourselves and believed that we were blessed by God, even put on our coins and our money in God we trust, right? And I thought... Could we become like that if we, his people, are not vigilant about keeping his word? And I remember um, this past week when I was thinking about that, I started to find some statistics and stuff just to see. And I looked back and I found that in 1973, 87% of Americans identified as Christians. But in 2023, that number had dropped to 65. Church membership has declined from 70% in 1999 to 47% in 2020. And the last one horrifies me. In 1965, nearly 60% of Americans attended church once a week, 23% in 2024. Yeah? And I couldn't help but wonder, my friends, if that hasn't been the cause for so many other ills in our country. For instance, the percentage of children living with two married parents has decreased from 92% in 1960 to 59% today. Since 1970, there has been a 74% increase in domestic violence. The number of children ages 3 to 17 diagnosed with depression grew by 27% just between 2016 and 2022. Within the period from 2011 to 2022, the suicide rate increased by 16%. Overall, 22% of high school students in a recent survey said that they had seriously considered suicide within the past year, which is up from 8% in 1980. Scary stuff, right? And folks, you know, I'm not one these days to maybe believe statistics and polls. You know how those go, right? But I can vouch in my ministry for these statistics, right? In the 30 years that I have been a pastor, I've seen such changes, such radical changes in just the average family dynamics, right? And I've seen so many societal changes as well. For instance, like music, up until 15 years ago, they had to put those explicit warnings on it if they had words in it. How many of you remember a day when they couldn't swear on TV, 
Anybody remember that? Right? You see, it's just like Satan to nip away piece by piece until we don't even recognize how it used to be. I was talking to my daughter the other day about this. I said, oh, Dad, there was never a time like that. There was. There was. And before you know it, we're just like in Josiah's time, right? And it's not just in societal ills and stuff like that. It's also religiously, right? And I'm just going to use the Sabbath as, as, as one example. How many of you remember the blue laws, what we call the blue laws, right? We use that term down in the South. But blue laws used to be laws set forth by government to protect the Sabbath, right? One of them was that you couldn't sell alcohol on Sundays. That law was repealed in Oregon in 2002, right? And all across this country, like when I was growing up, it was forbidden to have school, uh, uh, sports schools on Sunday. And a lot of places, they didn't have it on Wednesday because that's when they had their midweek programs, right? That's not by it. You don't have that anymore, do you, right? And there are so many other things, guys, that I remember uh, one time I was sitting down with a, uh, a friend of mine, and uh, it's been a couple of years ago, and he was talking, he had a crusade about prayer in school, and he was telling, you know, I believe the, uh, the answer to all of our problems is to put prayer back in school. I couldn't help but, like, laugh at him hysterically because I thought, you know, John, that's like putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. I'd be just thankful if God's people respected his day from start to finish. I said, just think. Just think what would happen in this country if people were as concerned about getting their kids in church and in youth group to hear God's word as they were about taking them to soccer practice. You know, when I was in school, um, I'd be a hypocrite if I ever said that I was against uh, sports schools. I played three in high school, and I'm thankful that I did. It taught me a lot about team, you know, teamwork and everything like that. And I was also proud of the accomplishments we did. We took the state championship in my uh, junior year when I was in soccer. And I was proud of those accomplishments. But I'll never forget my dad said to me, he said, Jason, I don't care what you, uh, what you join or whatnot. But if you make a commitment to the church, you will not break that no matter what you have to do. Right? And I just think about all the different changes that we've had in our country. You know, I had a, a, a friend, a person that I actually uh, know, met at a youth conference. His name's um, Shane Pruitt. And he uh, talks a lot about uh, youth ministry and stuff like that. And he had this book about called The Generational Fade, right? About how, like I said, Satan slowly pulls us away from God. And I like this uh, thing that I saw of his online. And this talks about the generational fade. He said, the first generation, parents don't make church a high priority for their kids. Second generation, kids grow up and make it less of a priority for their kids. Third generation, those kids grow up and make it no priority for their kids. And fourth, those kids grow up with no concept of God. Folks, I believe that 110%, except that I just don't believe that it takes four generations for it to happen, right? You know, I wondered, (laughs) I don't anymore, but I used to wonder how the Jews in Josiah's time could go from people of the book to people who couldn't even find the book. Yeah? You know, every so often, the church of Jesus takes an honest evaluation, and it changes itself, right? In the 1500s, church was corrupt, and so you had the Great Reformation, right, and where they reformed the church. It had gotten so corrupt that literally the Catholic church was selling indulgences. Do you know what indulgences were, right? Let's say I wanted to cheat on my wife. I could go and I could pay my priest. And he said, okay, that'll forgive you ahead of time. <laughs> Crazy stuff, right? Martin Luther, Luther said no more, right? And, um, and, and the church went through the Reformation. In the mid-1800s, America and the world was beginning to fall away from God. Church um, uh, attendance was beginning to drop, and a couple really important preachers came about, like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. And that era became known as the Great Awakening, when the church awoke again, right? And even in our story today, the story of Josiah, you know, Josiah was one of those persons who didn't just hear about it and say, oh, that's a shame, right? He did something about it. In fact, he went through a period where he tore down all the altars throughout all of the land, burned them, and he restored God's law to the law of the land, right? And things changed. In fact, uh, one of my favorite passages in the Bible I'm going to share with you um, is found about Josiah. It says, neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength in accordance with all the laws of Moses. Some people like to say that uh, King David or King Solomon was the best king that Israel ever had. I strongly disagree. You see, this was a man who saw the problem. He didn't make excuses, right? Didn't run from it, didn't hide from it. He attacked it, right? And he made the changes necessary for his nation, right? My friends, I have heard it many times. Some people have lost faith in this current generation. Nothing gets me more angry as a youth pastor, right? 
Those people do not know the precious souls that I have the privilege of working with every Sunday night. And just last Sunday night, I was praying with a precious soul who was really troubled by some things going on in her family. And I have heard those stories exponentially more in the last 15 years than I did in the first part of my thing. And I think as a pastor, Lord, what can I do? It breaks my heart. I mean, once you get to know them, anybody who works with youth, right? You get to know them. You know how precious they are. And you, you know, I met as a youth pastor, um, <laughs> maybe I'm fatalistically optimistic sometimes, you know, about them, right? But I see their gifts. I see their talents. And I think, mm, and I just want you to attack that, right? And then I see how the world attacks them, yeah. bullies them. And I hate to say it, but I feel like the church of Jesus isn't attacking these changes like they should. If anything, we go out and we pick it. There was a guy down. I remember uh, my daughter was going to University of Oregon and went down. And um, <laughs> it was on the street corner. It was like there was like three marijuana dispensaries on this corner and stuff like that. And there were some people coming out of some bars that were drunk this day. And this guy was just screaming at the top of his lungs, repent, you're all going to hell and all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, really? That's where you want to start with? <laughs> right? Maybe true, but is that really where you want to start with? How about let's say we love you. Your God loves you completely and absolutely. And we start there. Amen. Wouldn't that be different? Yeah. See, my friends, we as a people, God's people, can't bury our heads in the sand anymore. Yeah. There have been changes that are not good, right? And they're affecting our kids. But if we bury our heads in the sands, we can't become an agent for God to change it, yeah. right? I want to be like Josiah. I want our church to be like Josiah, to get down. What did he do first? He prayed. He got down on his knees, the best place to start, right? But then he got up and he did something about it, right? And so today, I want to challenge all of you. I'm going to ask Liam and uh, Evan to come up. And they're going to stand up here on either side, one on each side, right? Down here on the floor. And I'm going to play a video, right? And I want you in silence Watch the video and be thinking. And if God lays on your heart to come forward and take the names in these baskets are the names of the kids that go to our youth group. And what I want to do is spiritually adopt them and say that we're going to pray for you. I want to pray for you every time I go before the Lord in prayer for the couple weeks, in the weeks that come all the way to the end of this year, believing. You know, James says, if you pray but you don't believe, it's like praying to the four walls. Why bother, right? But we need to believe that God's going to make such an impact in their life that they're going to have such a foundation that not even the gates of hell can prevail against them, right? And so what I'm asking you is, if you feel led, but only if you feel like, you know, yes, every time I pray, I can pray for these kids and I can bring them before the throne of God, right? But if you can do that, then come up and take one of these names as you watch this video.